Hello, everybody. I'm not Vivian Perry. I'm not a journalist. I'm Chantal Mathieu. I'm an endocrinologist from Leuven, Belgium. And uh, I'm talking today with Stefan Anker, cardiologist from uh, the Charité in uh, Berlin, Germany. Stefan, you were the uh, first author of the New England Journal paper on Emperor Preserved. And on Thursday, there was a, a, a very nice session at this year's ESD. Can you remind us the highlights of the Emperor Preserved, Stefan? Why is this such an important study? Yeah, thank you so much. Well, basically, the short version is this. Heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction is a huge unmet need. We, there's about 30 million people in the world with this disease. And so far, we have no evidence-based medicine approach for these patients. Patients are treated for their comorbidities. Patients are treated as if they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And in the past, several trials uh, either were uh, neutral or basically were near misses, but nobody actually was able to show a significant, meaningful benefit. And now we have uh, achieved this. And this is important for these patients because they have so many uh, hospitalizations. They have such a poor quality of life. They have, in general, reduced uh, survival also. And so making a difference there uh, is medically important for these patients. For also, I would say, the society uh, reducing somewhat the burden overall. And can you explain to me as an endocrinologist what exactly the difference is between HEFPEF, so the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, and HEFREF, where we have a reduced ejection fraction? How can we, as endocrinologists, see that? Well, thank you for asking this. Uh, there is uh, maybe uh, really only a cardiology way of seeing the real difference because the symptoms and signs of the patients are by and large similar. They have congestion, they have edema, they have shortness of breath, poor exercise capacity. And as I said, they go all into the hospital and have a reduced survival. So heart failure is reduced and preserved ejection fraction is in that sense very similar. Where there is a difference is in the cardiac function, is in the exact generation of all the problems. So if you think about the heart action, which is mainly as a pump, uh, that is called the systolic uh, function of a heart. And the systolic action is, in most cases, uh, really uh, what, what people focus on. And in heart failure, there's a reduced ejection fraction, where the pump function positively, pumping out the blood, is reduced and the ejection fraction is low, below 40%, below 35%. That is one kind of heart failure. But think about the pump action uh, part two, which is that the pump also needs filling. On the one hand, it's pumping out, but then it needs to be filled again with blood. And if this filling part is impaired, you can also have a problem. That's the diastolic part or or really the relaxation part of the heart action. And now there's a number of comorbidities that impact uh, on this relaxation capacity, and that is where then heart failure with an, a preserved ejection fraction, 50% and higher in many cases, is really uh, uh, what we see. And you can only measure it with echocardiography to establish uh, what exactly is going on. Okay, so an echocardiography is the only way to differentiate, but I, I heard you very well saying the symptoms are very similar, and now we as endocrinologists, but also primary care and cardiologists, have even a, a simpler job, because now we have a class of agents, and I have to say one agent with a, a study, namely uh, empagliflozin, that is as effective in individuals with preserved as a uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction. Is that my correct interpretation? That in the end, Absolutely. it doesn't matter? Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter for this one drug. Okay. Uh, or for this one drug class, because I would assume that uh, dapagliflozin, there is the ongoing deliver trial that will report in, towards the end of the first half year next year. I would assume uh, it shows similar results. I would hope it shows similar results to validate this approach. So for the class of SGLT2 inhibitors, I think we can soon forget about ejection fraction. However, there are so many other therapies that need guidance, uh, be it other drugs, 
but also devices, maybe even drugs against arrhythmias in patients. And so uh, I would say we need um, the ejection fraction still, but for other things than deciding about empagliflozin or dapagliflozin. And what is the special relationship between diabetes and HFPEF? Is that you know, a, a match made in heaven or in hell, I should say. Is it more frequent? Are these the typical patients? Well, diabetic patients in our trial made up half of the population uh, we studied. But there's other comorbidities that are, that are also important, atrial fibrillation, also half the patients. Uh, and uh, if you take, for instance, COPD, at least 20% of the patients, uh, chronic kidney disease with a GFR less than 60, we had 50% of patients. So there is a big uh, intersection between different comorbidities and diabetes is at the core where once you have diabetes, you have many problems. And so diabetic patients are very prone to develop heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, but by no means is this the only group developing it. This is the reason why we had the study done half in diabetics, half in non-diabetic. Yeah. Did you identify individuals uh, w when you did the subgroup analyses where it seemed to work better or where it didn't seem to work at all? Well, focusing first of all on the primary endpoint, uh, I would like to say we had 13 pre-specified subgroups. And there was not a single pre-specified subgroup with a significant interaction not even a trend for an interaction with the lowest p-value for any of these interactions, 0.21. So there was basically a homogeneity of the effect across all these um, subgroups. And, and so maybe let's turn around this question, in whom should we maybe consider not starting yes. Uh, yes. an FGLT2 inhibitor at this moment in half -path? Well, it's very few patients. Uh, and let me say it this way. First of all, if you currently have an, a severe infection, um, except with COVID, that is a severe infection, but even in COVID, we now have some safety data that you might use it. The DR19 study wasn't that bad, and big trials are now taking place in this field. But let's say you have an acute surgery planned with lots of fluid changes. Let's say uh, you are undergoing a severe fasting process with ketone body accumulation, then you shouldn't start it. And maybe as one additional group, if you are a patient with a very high ejection fraction and you are not certain that this patient really has heart failure, then you should double and triple check uh, that this patient really has heart failure and maybe not something else like amyloidosis where we have completely different therapies. So being certain about the heart failure if this is a given, uh, if you do not have surgery or fasting processes ongoing, then essentially everybody can be given. That's 95% plus of patients. Yes, and of course, we also see the genital infection. So uh, we know by using uh, SGLT2 inhibitors as glucose lowering agents that individuals who've had frequent genital infections are also, uh, you know, they will get them again uh, very frequently when you yes. give them an SGLT2 inhibitor. Yes, that is, that is something to, to, of course, look after. Or even if somebody had a known or several known episodes of ketoacidosis, yes. then they may be patients at higher risk for this. So you might want to be double and triple careful uh, in such patients. Yeah. Um, what about your opinion on, on using this in people with type 1 diabetes and uh, heart failure? Well, there is no study yet, so yeah. it's, it's really only an opinion. I, I can't see really a reason for not doing it. Uh, one or two drugs have type 1 diabetes approvals, not for heart failure patients with type 1, but type 1 in general. So I, I think SGLT2 inhibitors also have a place uh, yeah. in the treatment for these patients. No reason why it wouldn't work. Correct. So we just need to convince the, the regulators to allow us uh, also to use it in, in people with type 1 diabetes. So um, any last messages you want to say to the endocrinologist, to the primary care physicians, to the cardiologist about your study? What is the bottom line? The bottom line is it couldn't be easier to give now benefits to have patients. These patients. These drugs are once daily, no electrolyte problems like with other drugs. Uh, so it's, it's no titration issue. Uh, 
uh, this, there is no reason not to give these medicines um, and, and reasonably uh, from a cost standpoint, they are also uh, with regards to the economic situation. So um, just do it. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. So our life just became a, a little bit easier as endocrinologists, primary care physicians, cardiologists, anybody treating uh, people with uh, type 2 diabetes, probably also type 1 diabetes, and uh, everybody with uh, heart failure. We have now data, not only in HEF-REF, but also in HEF-PEF, that the SGLT2 inhibitor class, and specifically in this study, empagliflozin gives us protection against hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular mortality combined as an endpoint. Thank you for your attention.